بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم أنا الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وسلم يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله حق تقاته ولا تموتن إلا وأنتم مسلمون يا أيها الناس اتقوا ربكم الذي خلقكم من نفس واحدة وخلق منها زوجها وبث منهما رجالا كثيرا ونساء واتقوا الله الذي تساءلون به والأرحام إن الله كان عليكم رقيبا يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله وقولوا قولا سديدا يصلح لكم أعمالكم ويغفر لكم ذنوبكم ومن يتع الله ورسوله فقد فاز فوزا عظيما أما بعض فإن خير الكلام كلام الله وخير الهدى هدى رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم وشر الأمور محدثاتها وكل محدثة بدعة وكل بدعة ضلالة وكل ضلالة في النار We are still in the chapter of the clothing of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sallam and it is a, a wide and an expansive chapter quite naturally if he came with the religion that's going to address all of the issues that Benny Adam they need to know about then clearly the type of clothes that they can or they cannot wear or should not wear is going to be an expansive bab. And it's only befitting and it's only natural for his sunnah, his religion, to address this issue. So we now come to the hadith number 59 in the book. Number 59. And this chapter is one of the Osa and Atwal chapters, one of the longer chapters. But nonetheless, inshallah, we'll finish it today. This is the chapter of an incident in which Anas ibn Malik, may Allah be pleased with him, he said that the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam kharaja wa huwa yattaki'u ala Usama ibn Zaydin ridwan Allahi alayhima wa alayhi thawb qitriyun qad tawashaha bihi fa salla bihim. He came out while he was leaning on Usama, the son of Zaid. And he had a thob on that Anas said was Qatriyun. Qatriyun and not Qatariyun. A thob from the people of Qatar, 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 that is known today. So the tashkil of the word is Qatriyun, Qatriyun. And that thob was totally surrounding him and was fitting loosely and hanging loosely upon him. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So the thawb that is qitri is the thawb that actually comes from al-Yemen. And it is a thawb of beautification, clothing of beautification that has some stripes in the material itself. So it's one of the many ahadith that are brought in this chapter showing the variety of clothes that the Prophet used to wear. Sallallahu alayhi wa ala alayhi wa sallam. He used to wear jubba. He used to wear julla. He, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, used to wear kisa. He used to wear rida. He used to wear the thob or the qamis. He used to wear different types of materials from different parts of the world even. And we'll end that up and explain that wisdom at the end of the chapter, inshallah, azawajal. This hadith is referring to the incident in which the Nabi, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, was sick the last part of his life. He came to the masjid with the assistance of Usama ibn Zaid in this particular hadith. He wasn't feeling well, so he was leaning on Usama, and Usama was helping him to come to the masjid, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and he had this particular thoban. And after coming to the masjid, he led them in the prayer. He led the companions in the prayer. So there's no ishkal in this particular hadith, no problem this hadith, except in Arabic, if you read the hadith and you don't, find the Dhamma and the Kasra and the Fatha, a person may read it as being a thawb that is Qatriyun, Qatriyun, like a thawb from Qatar. And that's not what the Hadith is talking about. In actuality, it's 
the opposite of that. It's a thobe that is well known from the people of Al Yemen. Hadith number 60, really important hadith, authentic hadith. The Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sallam as his companion Abu Sa'id al Khudri, one of the narrators that narrated and collected the majority of the hadith from the companions. So he's from the ulama of al hadith with the companions, from the mukthirin from them, radiallahu anhum ajma'in. He said that if the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wore something new, like a new thobe or anything that was new, he would call it by its name. So if he wore a thobe that was new for the first time, or an imama, a turban for the first time, or a qamis, a thobe, a shirt, his sirwal al khamis for the first time, if he wore a rida, the upper portion, the lower portion of the clothes that they used to wear, he used to make the dua. Allahumma lak alhamd kama kasawtanihi as'aluka khayruhu wa khayra ma suni alahu wa a'udhu bika min sharrihi wa min sharri ma suni alahu if the Nabi wore anything like that he would name it not he would give the piece of clothing a name he has a new hat so he's going to call that hat some name no he gave his camel a name Camel, it had a name, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. But when it came to his thobes and his clothes, he didn't call his name anything. He didn't call his clothes anything. The meaning of the statement of Abu Sa'id al Khudri, he would name the clothing. The meaning of it is he would put it in this dua. The dua is, Allahumma lak al hamd, kama kasawtani hadha thob, kama kasawtani hadhi al imama. That's what it means by he would name it. Oh Allah, praises are due to you for giving me this thobe, for giving me this hat, for giving me this jacket, for giving me these socks, for giving me whatever the portion or what the particle it was wearing, it, that was being worn. That was from his sunnah. So he would say, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, all praises are due to you for giving it to me. I ask you for the good of what the good of it and the good that it was manufactured for. And I seek refuge in you from the evil of it and from the evil of why it was manufactured. And that's from the teachings of the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that he taught this ummah, this dua that is baraka and in it is it's a dua that's mubarak. Only a few people would take time out to try to memorize these everyday mundane uh, issues that we do all the time despite the fact that they have a lot of virtues in them so he sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sallam will wear the thobe realizing that the abd is muftaqir in Allah the slave needs Allah for everything so in such a mundane issue Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam's dua was connected to praising Allah azawajal for the good of what the thobe was made for and the thobe is made for a lot of good and in the thobe is a lot of evil. From what the thobe is made of that is good for us is that it hides our total and absolute nakedness. And that's a ni'mah. So it's been mentioned in many ayat of the Quran. Ya bani Adam qad anzalna alaykum libasan yurawi so'atakum wa risha. Oh bani Adam, we gave you some clothes. And the clothes that we gave you, they hide your nakedness. They hide your nakedness. They protect you and your nakedness. So if a person was walking around with no clothes on, then that's a problem. In the society that we live in, in the religion that came to us, it's a big problem. From the good of the thobe as well, it not only does it hide the nakedness, but it hides a person's aura. Because in our religion, a person doesn't necessarily have to be totally, absolutely dressed from head to toe in all of his situations. It's a situation where... If he's not in this prayer, then it's permissible for him to sit, but his aura has to be covered up. And the more that's covered up, the better. The ayat of the ayat, the ayat of the Quran mentioned, Ya Bani Adam, khudu zinatakum in the kulli masjidin. O Bani Adam, wear your beautiful apparel at all of the masjid. When it's time for the prayer, and it's unanimous, ittifaq, ijma dhulema, that the meaning of this ayat is, cover up your aura at the time of the salat. So that's from the good of the, the thobe, the clothes that people wear. 
is that it covers up a person's aura. Many issues. It's from the ayat of Allah, from the beauty of Allah, the fact that Allah Ta'ala, as the Prophet says, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, in Allah yuhibbu an yara athar ni'matihi ala abdihi, if Allah gave his slave something, Allah loves to see the ni'mah that he gave to his slave. So wearing clothes is from the ni'mah of Allah Azza wa Jalla. In some of those ayat in which the clothing is mentioned, Allah ended off those ayat by saying, this is from the ayat of Allah. No one will reflect except the people who have intelligence. So there's a lot of good that comes from the clothing. It beautifies you, it protects you, it warms you up. He said about our women, those of us who are married, antum libasun wa libasun you are a clothing to your women and your women are a clothing to you. So being married, it is a ni'mah from Allah. It's a part of completing, completing your life, everything your clothes do for you, your wife does for you. So this hadith of the Nabi, sallallahu alayhi wa ala alayhi wa sallam, is from his sunnah to praise Allah Azza for the big favors and the small favors and not to leave anything. And from the dua, it shows, I seek refuge in the evil of these clothes and from the evil of what they were manufactured as a result of. So it goes to show that our clothes have evil in it. From the statement of the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, everybody who's sitting here, we have some clothes on and Al-Islam says something about every piece of clothing that we have on, every single person who's sitting here right now. It's our religion. Islam says something about every piece of clothing that you have on right now there's something in this religion, from this religion, from the Quran, from the Sunnah, that addresses every single thing that you have on, every single thing that I have on. One of the big proofs that, again, Al-Islam is the religion that came, and it is the religion of the Haq that explains and addresses everything that people need to know. So from the evil of the clothes, is that the evil can be in the clothes themselves, or they can be connected to the clothes, like the one who wears the clothes of a shuhra the clothes to be known by those clothes, drawing the attention of the people to himself and away from Allah Azza wa Jal. The clothes that are worn out of, out of, as a result of al-khuyayla, al-khuyayla and al-kibr, out of arrogance. The person wears that particular clothing because he's from the mutakabirin, from the mustakbirin. A person who has al-isbal, a person who's wearing a color that's not permissible, like the complete absolute red that he prohibited us from wearing, although he wore, wore red, that wasn't complete absolutely red, as we mentioned before and will mention, inshallah, in this chapter as well. So there are a lot of issues. Al-Isbal, wearing gold, wearing clothes that have gold in it, clothes that have um, silk in it, all of that is what the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa ala alayhi wa sallam he sought refuge in Allah in this dua every single day. If he put on something new, then that's the dua. Alhamdulillah, ladi kasoni, kasoni, hada athob, hada al qamiz, hada al rida, whatever it is. As aluka khaira ma suni alahu, wa as aluka khaira ma fihi, wa khaira ma suni alahu, wa audu bika min sharrihi, wa min sharri ma suni alahu important dua. This hadith was also collected by Al Imam Abu Dawood. The same hadith. But he added on to the hadith that Nudra, Nudra, he said that if the companions saw anyone that had a new thoban, the companions would say to his brother, to that individual, Tubli, Tubli, wa yukhlifullahu ta'ala. They would make that dua. Learning from that dua of the Nabi Sallallahu May you wear that thobe until it wears out. He sees that the thobe is brand spanking new. He made a dua. May you wear that thobe. May it relax and you keep wearing it until it wears out. And when it wears out, may Allah Azza wa Jal give you a new one and he replaces it. So in what was collected by Imam Abu Dawood, he brought the same hadith, but he brought the addition, which is also important because it came from what the companions used to do. Nudra said that the companions, Radwan Allah alayhim ajma'in, if they saw an individual wearing a thobe or something that would know, they didn't have hatred in their heart for their Muslim brother. They didn't have that heart because from the evil of the thobe is, some people may look at a thobe that someone else has and he gets hasad and hucked from it. He's envious and he's jealous. 
When Nabi told the people, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Allah never gave you any ni'mah. Any ni'mah that Allah gave you, there's someone who is hasid over that ni'mah. So whatever ni'mah, and everybody here has a number of favors that Allah bestowed upon them. There is somebody who is not liking it. Some hater who he wants that thing to be taken away from you. Whether he gets it or not, he doesn't want you to have it. But the companions, may Allah be pleased with all of them, that wasn't their way. We told you the other day, there are no narrations in which a companion has con been considered to be a kithab, <coughs> a kithab or a person who didn't have adala in his religion. All of them are udul. They're the only generation of human beings where every single one of them is fiqh. every single one of them. You're not going to come, you're not going to bring a hadith where there's delil that a companion had jealousy in his heart or something like that. Naam, the prophet had wives, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, radiyallahu anhu, but that thing that transpired between his wives, that is not the jealousy of hatred and the jealousy that comes from a shaitan where a person wants to see the nitma of someone taken away. That's just the natural jealousy that human beings have, the natural jealousy that your children may have between themselves if you don't deal correctly and justly between them. Something that's natural. As for having anger, hatred, jealousy, because Allah blessed someone with a ni'mah, they weren't upon that. So they used to say to the person, may you continue to wear that new clothing until it gets finished and worn out. And when it gets finished and worn out, may Allah give you better or replace it. So again, Ikhwani, the sunnah of the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in regards to our clothing, this important issue that we come to learn those dua connected, and they are many. Like the hadith, the hadith that's been collected by Imam al-Hakim. We have to put our clothes on every day. That's what the Prophet said if he wore a new thobe, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. But if he wore any thobe, any clothes, you want to put your clothes on, your underwear, akramakumullah, your outerwear, you want to get dressed in the morning, he says, Sallallahu alayhi wa ala alayhi wa sallam, and Nabi said, Thawb, and Thumma qal, Alhamdulillah, Levi Kasani, Hadha Thawb, Ghufir Allahu ma taqaddama min dhambihi. Anyone who puts his clothes on and he says, All oh, praise to Allah, who put this, gave me this Thawb, he will be forgiven for all of his sins. Another narration brought some ziyada. Whoever says, Alhamdulillah, Levi Kasani, Hadha Thawb, min ghayri hawlin minni wa la quwwatin. Anyone who says that, simple, easy dua, Allah Azrajal will forgive him for his sins that went before. So learn those simple duas, just a few in this issue that we do every day. Because we do it every day, inshallah, we won't forget. And remember the hadith al-Qudsi, the hadith al-Qudsi, we did the explanation of that hadith al-Qudsi. When Allah told his servants from Bani Adam, Ya ibadi kullukum arin illa man kasawtuhu. أَقْسُكُمْ O sons of Adam, children of Adam, my servants, all of you are naked. All of you are naked. You don't have any clothes except that the one that I gave him clothes. I clothe him. So seek to be clothed by me and I will clothe you. So this is from the ni'mah of the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam's sunnah that he taught us. After that, ikhwani, the next hadith also is by Abu Sa'id al-Khudri. It's similar to the previous hadith there's no new information that we'll touch upon that's being brought in the second hadith. And Imam al-Tirmidhi, like the ulama of al-Hadith, bring the same hadith with multiple chains and narrations, and they do it for reasons. If that particular reason is not going to bring us a lot of benefit, we won't deal with it in this particular class. We come now to the following hadith. And the following hadith, number 62 is the hadith of Anas ibn Malik. There was no thobe that the Prophet loved. He loved the most. Kana ahabbu thiyab ila Rasulillahi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam yalbasuhu al-hibara. The thobe that he used to love to wear the most is the al-hibara. Al-hibara. That's a thobe. That is a thobe that you dress up in. It's a particular kind of thobe that you dress up in. It has... Lines in it is not the everyday ordinary thobe. It's like your Sunday's best, as they say in America. The Sunday's best 
are the best clothes that the people wait to wear them on that particular day like we do for Al-Juma and for the Eid. It's not the clothes you wear every day. So this Al-Hibra Thobe, the Prophet used to love it and it had red in it. But the red of the Thobe was not totally, absolutely red all by itself. So that explains why he would wear it, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, although he prohibited us from wearing a Thobe that is totally red. He himself wore some clothing that had red lines in it or they were mixed with red and black lines and this is one of the situations and again it's the variety of the clothes that he used to wear sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sallam so a lot of kalam has been mentioned about this Arabic word al-hibara what is it exactly the scholars give different interpretations but for the most part it is the piece of clothing that has red in it and it's dress clothes it's not just the normal clothes that a person would just wear any day of the week it's when he's going to get really dressed up showing that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam he used to make the ta'zim of the munasibat of the ayam if there was a particular occasion or a particular day he would represent based upon what was going on that day so if you get invited to dinner if you get invited to a wedding if you get invited to a place don't go like a bum and then say that's the sunnah because there are some ahadith that he says, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Al Badada to Minal Iman. Al Badada is when a person doesn't comb his hair and he doesn't put oil in his hair and he doesn't really look at his attire. He doesn't want to become the slave of the foe. He doesn't want to become the slave of his clothes, the way he's looking. So he said, Ta'isa Abdul Dinar, wa Ta'isa Abdul Dirham. Wata'isa Abdul Khamisa. All of those people are going to be destroyed. The one who worshipped the dinar and the dirham and the clothes. He was too into his clothes. So he said, not taking care of your clothes is from Al-Iman. We explained the meaning of that. Is that Islam doesn't want you to be dirty, doesn't want you to be a bum, doesn't want you to be disheveled. Jibril came to the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in a way in which he looked like he was a traveler, but he wasn't a traveler, and his hair was disheveled. If it's totally, absolutely haram for a person to have disheveled hair at all times, he would have said, you can't have your hair like that. Like the man who came to him, and he had lice jumping all out of his head. And the Prophet saw, told him, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, rectify your situation. When the man went and he cut his hair off, got rid of the, ice, the lice, he came back, he told him, Asanta, you did a good job. Another man, his hair was disheveled. And he left it like that for a long time. He told the people and he told that man, Man kana lahu sha'ran fal yukrimhu. Anyone who has hair, let him take care of it. And then the man combed his hair out and the Nabi said, this is good. The meaning of al badadatu min al-iman. Not combing your hair sometimes is from al-iman. It means don't be a slave to your outer looks. Don't be an individual who you are really going OTT, OCD as it relates to your outer look. But if you have a job and you're an individual every day, you look in the mirror, you want to come out looking nice, there's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with any of that. Just we have to be balanced. So the Prophet will wear clothes, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, that were reflective of what was going on. The walima, the day of the Eid, someone's going to get married. Don't go to that place looking like a bum, and then you say, the sunnah, the sunnah. No, the sunnah didn't tell you to look like that. Sunnah told you, dress appropriately for the occasion. So that's the main thing about this particular hadith of the Nabi, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Hadith number 63, Juhayfa, Radwan Allahi alayhi, said that he saw the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and he had a hulla that was hamra on, and it was as if I can see the luster of his two legs. So this hadith goes to show that the Prophet wasallam wore some clothes and the color of the clothes was red. But as I mentioned to you before, it wasn't totally, absolutely red. So if someone has some clothes that has some red in it, it's permissible to wear. Red lines or the thobe or the clothes itself are red, but there are other colors in it then it's permissible. What's not permissible is for a person to have a totally, absolutely red 
piece of clothing that he's wearing. And if he wanted to avoid red altogether to get out of the mashakil of the ikhtilaf, then inshallah ta'ala, that's beneficial. One of the things of this hadith is that Juhayfa, may Allah be pleased with him, he said he saw the legs of the Prophet sallallahu and he saw the luster or the beauty of his legs. This is one of the hadith that the prophets, that the ulama of Islam used to show that the thobe of the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was to the halfway point of his shin. Not only did he tell people, you should wear your thobe as a man halfway to your shin, and if you don't want to, then lower, and if you don't want to, then lower, and if you don't want to, then lower, and beware of the ankle bones. For verily, what is below the ankle bone is in the hellfire. So the asal of our pants, the origin in El Islam, the man's izar, the man's pants, the man's longi, his ma'wiz, his thobe, whatever he's wearing on the lower extremities, the asal of it is for it to be halfway to the shin. And then if he doesn't want it there, lower, 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 but it shouldn't be below the ankle bone. So Juhayfa, may Allah be pleased with him, said, when the Prophet wore this particular hullah, when he wore it, it was red, and it's as if I'm looking at the luster of his legs. So he didn't say, he didn't say, I saw the ankle bones of the Nabi, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He said he saw his legs. We know he didn't see his thighs. We know he didn't see his thighs, so it leaves nothing but the sock to remain to the imagination. So it's one of the proofs that the scholars used to show the Rasulullah not only said to do this thing, but he himself, he did it. Sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sallam. Al-Bura ibn Azib, may Allah be pleased with him, he said, I never saw anyone who looked more beautiful in a red thobe or hulla than the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sallam. Again, it's similar to the previous hadith, and some of the scholars can criticize that hadith. Al Muhim, the one before it is authentic. Abdullah or an Abi Rimtha, and we took this hadith in the first class. He said that he saw the Prophet وسلم, and he had a burdan that was green. He had a burdan that was green. And the burdan is the type of clothing. That has two parts to it. In the Arabic language, it won't be called the burdan if it didn't have two parts to it. And this particular one that the Prophet was wearing, it had the color green. And also, it wasn't the, wasn't the complete exact type of green. It was a faded away color of green. So when the people wear green trying to get close to Allah, Azza wa Jal, uh, there's no delil encouraging the Muslims to wear green and trying to get close to Allah being on some special sunnah of the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. That's going to come in the last hadith. He wore green, that was the color that was available and there's no special significance for the color green in Al-Islam. So if a person has a black imama on, people connect that to Al-Jihad. He's a mujahid. Because he's wearing a black imama. And it is a fact. When the Prophet conquered Mecca, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he wore a black imama. But did he wear that to Abudan? Did he wear that to make a statement, here I am performing jihad, and this black imam is a part of jihad? Or he just had it on that day? Similar to that issue is the red thobe. Did he red, wear the thobe that had red in it? Did he wear a jubba? Did he wear a hulla? Did he wear a rida? Did he wear these things? I'm wearing this as ibadah? No, he didn't. He wore those clothes like the izar and the rida. He wore that to hajj, to abudin. So we're going to wear it because he, it was ibadah. That's why he did it. But outside of hajj, he would wear it. So do we wear that and say it's the sunnah? Yeah, it's the sunnah of his environment. It's the sunnah of where he came from. But he didn't tell us to wear red or green or to wear an izar. And a rida. He didn't tell us to do that. So if you want to do it in the environment where that goes, it meshes, no problem. But don't say that it is the sunnah. If you want to do it, trying to be like him as much as you possibly can within yourself, 
no problem. But don't say this is the sunnah and you're calling people to this type of uh, behavior because you may be making things unnecessarily difficult for the people. So in this particular hadith, the companion, عنه, he said that the Prophet وسلم, had these pieces of clothing on and they had green in it. So wearing the green imama, it shouldn't be synonymous with a zuhd. The one who wears this is a Sufi and he is a zahid. <coughs> That's not, uh, has anything to do with the religion at all. Those colors have nothing to do. You'll see the color that has something to do with the religion because he made it clear. And as I told you before, some of the ulama of Islam, they were of the opinion, the fact that the companion came and saw that his fold was open at the top, don't come and say that that's the sunnah because where is the delil that he told people to do that? Where is the proof that the other companions, they were doing that? So some of the scholars said, there's no delil for that. And others said, no, there are, there are some proofs. Too many people were doing it. It happened too many hadith. The point is, the point is, we can't claim that something is the sunnah or it's not the sunnah, except that we know where we're putting our feet down. And we have to have some proofs to say this. So in terms of the color green, have nothing to do with any ibadah from the ibadat of al-Islam. We have now, ikhwani, coming to the end of the chapter, the hadith of Qayla bintu Makhrama radiyallahu anha anhu anha qalat ra'aytu an-nabiyya sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wa alayhi asmal mulayyatayn kanata bi za'faran wa qad nafadathu she said i saw the prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam he had a small on and they were full and big and they had been and they had been dipped in za'faran they had been dyed in za'faran so I saw the Prophet with this piece of clothing on, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and they fit him very loosely, but the dye inside of the clothes, they were from Za'faran, she said, but the Za'faran was fading away. And Za'faran is that uh, ingredient that if you mix it with water, you leave it overnight, it becomes a dye. Women use it for henna, it makes things a color. You can put it in your beard, makes your beard orange. Prophet prohibited us, men, from dyeing their clothes in za'faran. It's not permissible. And that's because when you do that, the clothes at the beginning come out red. Exactly, completely red. So he said, don't wear clothes that have been touched by a za'faran. Where the redness of the clothes is one solid color of red. Prohibited it. And I said, Dalil, that uh, even the Kufan know that in the colors, there's a science in the colors. If you go to court and you have a, um, a lawyer, solicitor, knows what he's doing, the lawyer will advise you, don't wear this color, you should wear that color. If you want to bring out certain uh, emotions within an individual, like in the places where they hold people who are mentally challenged people have mental problems people in the hospital they paint the hospitals with certain colors because colors will have an impact on a person's feeling so the fact that the nabi sallallahu alaihi wasallam what's the wisdom that he said don't wear red there's some wisdom in it we may know the wisdom of this being halal or haram or we may not know but some of those scholars of al-islam they mentioned that the color red in itself is a problematic color. So he wore this thobe that had been dyed with za'faran, but as the companion said, the lady said, may Allah be pleased with her, the thobe was, the dye had faded away, so it was no longer totally, absolutely solid red. Hadith number 68. Ibn Abbas, <coughs> or Abdullah ibn Abbasin, he said that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Alaykum bil bayad min al thiyab li yalbisha ahya'ukum wa kafinu fiha mutakum fa innaha min khayri thiyabikum. You people should wear the white thobes from your thobes. Let those who are living from you wear it. And you who are living, bury your dead in it. For verily, that is from the best of the thobes that you can wear.
So religiously, the Nabi commanded us, encouraged us to wear white. So if a person wears white and he says, this is the sunnah, a sunnah that is a sunnah of ibadah, ta'abbadi, this thing, I'm doing it to get close to Allah in and of itself because the Prophet said it, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Wear your thobes, your white thobes, they're from the best of your thobes. Let those who are living from amongst you wear white. And let those who are living bury your dead in this white. Because it's from the best thobes. Why is white from the best thobes? Why is that? What's the illa? What's the hikmah? What's the reason? The sabab comes in the next hadith. And that is the hadith of Samara ibn Jundab. رضوان الله عليه قال صلى الله عليه وسلم البسوا البياض فإنها حط إنها أطهر وأطيب وأطيب وكفن فيها موتاك wear the white wear the color white for verily it is the purest color and it is the best color and bury in it your dead so the reason why he commanded us to wear the white, he said it was the purest color and it was the best color. Some of the ulama said the meaning of that is if a person were to wear white, our religion placed a lot of emphasis on cleanliness and nadafa. So if a person wears white, when he appears in that white, whiteness has an impact on the person. So when Jibril came, to teach the companions the religion, رضي الله عنهم أجمعين. He didn't have a sky blue thobe on. He didn't have a green thobe, a blue thobe. He had a white thobe on. And they said that his thobe was exceedingly white. It was very white, as if it was a new thobe. So if a person washes a thobe, he gets a new thobe, and he wears that thobe, it is from the purest, <coughs> from the purest of the colors. And that is also... Since Islam put a lot of emphasis on nadaf and cleanliness, if it gets dirty, it's going to show. So he won't be able to camouflage it. He'll either have to wash it, he'll have to wash it, or he'll have to change it. And if he washes it, he's back again, wearing a color that is pure and a color that is the best color. And he's looking radiant. And if he changes it, he got rid of a piece of clothing that has smells to it, that had some dirt on it, and so forth and so on, and he waits until it gets washed again, and he wears it again. So white is the color that we would say religiously, the Prophet encouraged the people, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, to wear as it relates to the thobe. And in this particular hadith, it's a general hadith. He said to the men and the women, actually, he said, sallallahu alayhi wa ala alayhi wa sallam, al-basu al-bayad. It's a general word. Wear the white. So it's not wajib for women to wear black, brown, gray, or blue, or dark colors. It's not wajib upon her. The companions, when the ayat of al-hijab came down, they went, the ladies, and they broke off some of the clothing that was, some of the cloth, the material that was in their house, they came out. Aisha said that the Ansar women put those clothes on them and they looked like black crows were upon their head. But she didn't say that the Prophet told us, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, to put these clothes that looked like black crows. This is what they did. And the hadith is general in his statement. So we can't make haram what Allah made halal. Some women, like the women of Egypt, when they're going to perform hajj, they only wear white. We don't say this is what you should do. I'm saying that the color black, brown, blue, there's no hadith. The Delil said, religiously you have to do that. And I'm saying that. But obviously the lady has to take into consideration her environment. She has to take into consideration what her husband wants. She has to take into consideration being a fitting in a trial. Because if wearing a color, although she hadn't been prohibited from wearing that particular color, it's going to make her stand out. Everybody else is wearing black. And that's what the women do in that society. And she wants to wear white. As a result of that, she stands out. We're going to say, your thobe now has become almost like the thobe of shuhra, where you are being known by this thing. So with that being the case, you should blend in with everybody else and not stand out in that particular issue. 
So he told the people in general. And the jama'ah, plural. Albisu albiyad, wear the white. And we can't be those people who come and say, this is only for the men. Where's the delil for that? The Quran and the Sunnah addresses the men and the women. And only when the delil come to make the distinction, we make that same distinction. So, ikhwani, the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa ala alayhi wa sallam used to encourage us to wear this white. And in his dua, like the dua istifta, the dua of the salah, Allahu Akbar. In one of those duas, he used to ask Allah Ta'ala, Allahumma naqini, نَقَّنِي مِنَ الْخَطَايَا كَمَا يُنَقَّ فَوْبَ الْأَبِدُ مِنَ الدَّنَسِ O Allah, purify me and make me clean and purify for my mistakes the same way you purify the white fob from the dirt. The same way that the white fob is purified from the dirt. O Allah, purify me for my mistakes, my sins, my mistakes. The same way that the white fob is purified from the dirt. So it goes to show that uh, emphasis uh, in terms of a tahara and being clean, uh, he wanted people to wear the white fold because it's, cl it's closer to purification, to a tahara and to a teeth. And the last hadith, Ikhwani, in this particular chapter, hadith number 770, is the hadith of Al Mughira ibn Shorba on the authority of his father, that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam used to wear a jubba that was from Rome. And the sleeves of his jubba were very tight. A jubba is the thing that you wear over your thobe. It's something you wear on the outside. Like the Moroccans wear that thing with the hood. That could be a jubba. A cape can be a jubba. So you have a thobe on, and the jubba is something that you wear over it. And in this case, his jubba had tight sleeves. So from the evil of clothes, is for the clothes to be tight. If the tightness described the contours of your body, the front and the back, man or lady. But it wasn't like that with the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He used to wear clothes that were white, but this jubba that he had, his sleeves on it were tight. And the jubba was from Rome. Again, it goes to show it's permissible to wear the clothes of kuffar. So permissible. I don't have to wear Arab clothes. I don't have to wear Izar. I don't have to wear Rida. I don't have to wear the clothes of Pakistan. I don't have to wear the clothes of any group of Muslims. There's no such thing as the clothes of the Muslim as such. The Prophet wasallam wore the clothes that he wore because of his environment. And no one has to wear the clothes of what the Arabs are wearing today. You want to wear silwar al-khamis like Pakistani people do? You can wear that. Just watch the material, watch the length, and watch all of those colors and so forth and so on. African person in Africa, he wears particular clothing, a keftan, he can stick to that. So we have the people who, when people come into Islam, we put pressure on them and we say, you have to put Islamic clothes on Meaning like a thobe and stuff like that. You don't got to wear a thobe. But it should be something that are, uh, fits inside of the uh, uh, regulations that have been set out in all of the books of Al-Hadith. All of the books of Fiqh. As we told you, there is the chapter of Al-Libas. So in this chapter, the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam wore all kinds of clothes. All kinds. A variety of clothes. Which goes to show the door is open for the type of clothes you want to wear, like the Imam read today from Surah Al-Baqarah. Allah Ta'ala mentioned about himself in the Quran that he created everything for us in the heavens and the earth. He created and made everything for us. So when it comes to what you eat, what you drink, what you wear, it's open. Don't worry about it. And what was collected by the Imam Muslim? He says, Sallallahu Alaihi wa ala alihi wa sallam, Kulu wa shrabu. وَالْبَسُوا وَتَصَدَّقُوا Eat, drink, dress, give sadaqa as you like. مِنْ غَيْرْ مَخِيلَةً وَلَا إِسْرَافٍ But don't be arrogant and don't go overboard. Wear what you want to wear, eat what you want to eat. 
and drink what you want to drink. But don't be arrogant and don't waste. So it's wide open. The religion came and said, don't do this though and don't do that and don't do this. Just a few issues. Just a few issues. And that's from the Rahmah of Allah and that's from the biggest benefits of this chapter. That the clothing in Al-Islam is up to you. Wear what you want to wear in terms of the color, in terms of the style, in terms of the length, whatever. Just beware of those things that were mentioned by the hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and don't make difficult upon people what Allah didn't make difficult upon them. As a matter of fact, he rebuked them and he made tawbih. He made tawbih. Of those people who make haram upon the people, the good things that Allah made halal for them. So if you brothers have any questions, inshallah, we'll deal with any question that you may have for 10 minutes, inshallah. Alindakum shay. Certainly the color of the thobe or the color of a turban. You can wear whatever you want to wear. Just be careful of the colors that are haram. Be careful of having isbal because having a long turban that drags behind you on the ground as the Arabs used to do, it is also an isbal and is impermissible. And also beware of the material. Don't wear a turban that's made out of silk those things that are haram. Don't be arrogant with it and so forth and so on. Get some fiqh about the turban. And again, in the books of al-hadith, especially the books of fiqh, the turban has fiqh connected to it because you're going to wipe on it. So when can you wipe on it? How do you wipe on it? Which brings us to the issue of how was the actual turban of the Nabi, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And some of the ulama of Islam, past and present, they said it's not this turban that we're wearing today like the people from Sudan, for an example, or anybody who wears a turban, where the turban is just on your head. Some of the I say, you can't wipe on that turban because the prophet didn't wear a turban like that. His turban was muhannika. It was muhannika. It was a turban that he wrapped it around his head and he also wrapped it under his chin. It wasn't just around his head. And the reason why he wiped on it was to make it easy. You don't have to take it off and then wipe your head so just wipe on it or lift it up and wipe on your forehead. So as it relates to the turban, the turban has a lot of fiqh in it. From the fiqh is you don't have to wear any particular special color with it to call this the sunnah. But he did wear the black turban when he conquered Mecca. He also had a white turban, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. As for him wearing green turbans, all of those hadith are fabricated and they're not true. تفضل يا أخي أبو إسماعيل The most beloved color to Allah is green. I didn't come across that. Have a pen. شكراً يا أخي. Hey, can somebody look that up? إن أحب can somebody look that up now? Now, Ahi, Nora Dean. Uh, that's a good question. We mentioned it's permissible to wear the clothes of the kuffar. So what about the hadith of the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and tashabbaha bi qawmin fa huwa minhum that uh, whoever resembles a people is from them and he needs to do his best sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to be different from the mushrikeen for us to be different from them. Well first we're going to say that clearly Abu Lahab and Abu Jahl they wore the same clothes that the Prophet wore, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. They wore the same rida and izar and things like this, jubba, they wore the same thing because of the environment, where they came from. 
but the length of what they wore was different. The texture of what they wore was different. And there were some differences, no doubt, in some of the things that they wore because Islam didn't let us wear that. Islam told the Muslims, don't wear that anymore. Don't wear gold, don't wear silk, and so forth and so on. But the Kufar of Quraysh and the Kufar in Al-Medina, that Khalij in the Gulf, they were all dressed in the same. It's their culture. That's the first thing. So what does it mean? Don't wear the clothes that you resemble a Kufar. The clothing that identifies the non-Muslim. And there's, when, as soon as you see that, that's what your mind goes to. That's the meaning of that prohibition of that hadith. So if there's a type of clothing that a non-Muslim wears that shows kufr, it means kufr. When you see it, you think your kid sees kufr. Everybody, even the kufar, they see kufr. This is the one that you should avoid. These are the clothes that you should avoid. Like the clothes of the priest who has that thing on his neck, for an example. Not so much the suit, but that thing on his neck. As soon as you see the thing on his neck, you know that that means a religious issue and so you're not going to wear it. Like the Hindu women and the way that they dress with the way they do the sari and the red thing on the head and the stomach and the meat is out, so forth and so on. Although some Muslim women in our cultures, there's a similar dress to that, like in the Sudan, like in Eritrea. They take that thing and a woman wraps herself around with it. But it's not like this. So the wrapping is not the problem. It's the end result. If you put a picture of the Hindu lady, the picture of the Indian Muslim lady with the same thing, they're going to look, look different. The way that she tied hers and the way that she tied her. So it's the clothing that is specific and peculiar, absolute for those non-Muslims. When you see it, that's what you know it is. Yeah, we'll come back to you, man. The Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sallam from his etiquette is that he used to cover up his head and he used to cover up his head because of his environment. The sun is hitting you in the head so they used to cover up their heads because of the environment. As for ordering people, you must wear something on your head. There's nothing in our religion that says that. That your salat, and it's authentic. That if you pray with your head covered, so many malaika, they make istighfar for you. And if you don't pray with your head covered, then that salat, Allah is not happy with. And so many hadith that people made up. The Prophet Wasallam's companions were praying due to the severe heat, the ground was hot some of them took their head covers off and put it down and they used it to make sajda to guard their heads from the heat of the ground show that they can pray without their heads covered but it was from the etiquette of the Muslims of the past it was from the mu'ru'a the gentlemanliness you know like in this country people you can go to a school and you can learn etiquettes how to put the forks you know, the silverware that you're going to eat. Things are in a particular place. This glass is for that, and this glass is for that, and this bowl is for this, and that bowl is for that. We don't go to school for that. So when we go to people who they're into this, we're going to take the soup bowl and we're going to eat the mashed potatoes with it because we don't know, we didn't learn that stuff. Some of us didn't even learn how to eat with those utensils. And I'm not blaming anybody, I'm just saying that's some people's situation. So when we talk about that etiquette, they used to teach that in this country. And from my travels, especially in Africa, you can see that's one of the good things that Britain gave to some African people that I've seen. People are very respectful in the way they talk and the way they are. They have manners. So in the past, it was the manners of a man, the muru'a of a man, his rojula, showing that he was a man. The fact that he would go out and his head was covered. And he wouldn't go out, and he wouldn't be seen with his head uncovered. As that would be a sign of immaturity. That would be a sign of him not being a real man, and so forth and so on. So every culture is different. It's not like that now. It's not like that now. So we're not going to be rough, and we're not going to be tough with people like that now. As a matter of fact, 
If you were to do certain Muslim cultures today, you get in trouble. Like the Yemenis people. From being a man and having a rujula is to you to, to wear that khanjara. There's that sword, that little knife. Not a sword along with the one that goes around. They put it right there and they walk around with it and it means status. When you look at him, it's a status that he's having when you look at him. He's a man. He's mature. He's muhaddab. He's an individual who deserves respect. You let him walk down Coventry Road looking like that. If he walks down Coventry Road looking like that, they're going to put him in a jail because he has a, a weapon on him and so forth and so on. So we're going to take into consider consideration the taghayyarat of the ahwal. The situation has changed. But I think we should get back. We should get back to that. Okay, Khwani. Tfadl ya akhi. Tfadl. Say it again. The hulla is a nice piece of clothing as well. It's a nice piece of clothing that a person wears. That are, uh, It's not the everyday ordinary dress, but it's the nice clothing. What did they translate it as in your book? They left it like that? Yeah, it's like a nice piece of clothing that uh, not the everyday clothes that a person wears. Hey, what the them. Yeah, that's a good point, Akhi Nuruddin. There are some people, if we were to see an individual wearing a turban, even if he was wearing it properly, like the people of Mauritania, a lot of them wear the turban the way that the Salaf used to wear the turban. Even if you see him wearing it properly, we'll get this shubha that he is a person who is a Sufi. He's on a Sufiya. And that's not uh, a good thing. Unless a person really knows his environment. This is the type of dress that these people wear. So a person shouldn't come and make takdeeb of the waqa. That's the waqa. So we're not going to say be stupid. But if you don't know the individual and the person does have the turban, we shouldn't have su'adhan right away. If you don't know the individual, we should say uh, this is uh, something that was and is from the sunnah of the Prophet wasallam. And although I may not like what this person is a pawn, although I don't like what he's a pawn, I can't dislike any aspect of the sunnah. Just like hating that word that we told you about, a salafia and a salafi. You can't hate the word because there's something about that person that you don't like. You can't hate al-Islam because the Muslim did something to you here or there. The way the Muslims are in this country. I saw this guy from Norway. He was a politician telling the people they don't want to have any of these immigrants come into their country and he was clear, he said, especially the Muslims. And unlike Trump, he was trying to say what he meant and how he felt based upon what the Muslims have done and what Islam has been shown, what's been shown as Islam to them. And to his credit, he wasn't backing down. And I understood what he was trying to say, that look, if you look at these Muslims and you see what they've done to our system, taking advantage of the system. And if you look and you see the extremism that they brought here in Norway, okay? The man was saying, they're extremists from every strand and every brand. But it's the Muslims specifically. If we look at it, this is what we're getting. And I understood what that guy was saying. So the point is, if an individual see that the Muslim is not acting correctly, he shouldn't hate us that. <coughs> Which brings me to the last point of your question, Akhi Nuruddin. Also, seeing people who wear their thobes high above their ankles shouldn't be something that you hate and something that you dislike. Because some people who are claiming a particular thing who dress that way because you don't like the way that they are, you don't like that aspect of the sunnah. If you see it in someone having his thobe halfway to his shin, you ridicule it or you don't like it. This is not acceptable as well. We have to be balanced. That's not acceptable. It's extreme. And the other one is not acceptable. Extreme. We have to love the sunnah. All of the sunnah. If a non-Muslim came and he has something in the sunnah in him, we'll appreciate the sunnah. We won't praise him anything like that. But we're going to say that's the sunnah. Whatever is the sunnah, 
That has khair in it. He did it intentionally, unintentionally. That is the haq, that thing is the sunnah. But he's not a Muslim, so he gets no reward. And if a person who is uh, uh, doing evil or something like that, we're going to make sure that that evil sticks with him and we don't connect it to the sunnah of the Nabi. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Okay, Ikhwani, we're going to stop here. Let me look for this hadith real quick. Abu Ismail. And we had the two brothers who I mentioned last week. I was asking about it. About the issue. Ish? Ish? About the issue of um, the thobe, of the Pakistani thobe, that the thobe, that the, the khamis is the Pakistani thobe. Did you guys find anything about that? Nobody found anything. Huh? Man, I'm not feeling well. Okay, here we go. Let's see. Yeah, right here it says that, uh, and then Bani said that this um, hadith, let me see. Let me check it out. أحب الألوان إلى رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم جاء في السلسلة الصحيحة عن أنس بن مال قال كان أحب الألوان إلى رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم الخضر حسنه على الباني كان أحب الألوان إليه من الثياب وغيره وغيرها لأنها من ثياب الجنة فالخضرة أفضل الألوان uh, This person said that this was the case because it was uh, the, 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 the color green is the color of al Jannah. So we have to go back and we'll read it. We'll check it out, inshallah. If it's Hassan, got to find out. Usually there's some problems with it. Multiple narrations made it strong, but it, it'll be a good bath. So we'll look into it, inshallah, all right? Hadha wa sallallahu wa sallam mubarak ala nabiyyina. وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته